Rumours and theories start in the media, again with no, <coughs> no proof, but a lot of people attending Melbourne Sexual Health indicate that they had the Borna virus. They now want to be single. They're having two, three sexual partners per week. What's happening to safe sex campaigns, Kit, now that the de demographics have changed? So uh, campaigns that try to reduce pleasure in a population don't work very well. <laughs> <laughs> if you want people to eat less or have less sex or use condoms more, they don't work really, really well unless there's some huge threat like there was with uh, HIV. The, 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 and, and, and two partners per week, so a lot of partners, usually it's one or two a year if you look at a heterosexual population. So we have a major, major problem and you'd have to implement a control strategy that might involve antibiotic prophylaxis, it might involve um, uh, frequent testing, it might involve, it certainly involve a public health campaign about what symptoms are like because almost everyone does get symptoms. But it would be uh, in employment to my retirement, I'm sure. Right. OK. So, Mike Catton. Mm. TV networks are getting nervous. They're about to start filming the new season of Married at First Sight and The Bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not available. We need... <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. We need to prove the link and we need a serology test fast, but mm. we still haven't isolated or grown this virus. Mm. How can we do it with only genetic sequence? Yeah, okay. I'll get to that in a sec, but, but it, it's not beyond, beyond the bounds of possibility that someone in the lab would have noticed, because we do the pathology for Melbourne Sexual Health and we're doing the Borna testing, and if you have someone sitting there validating out the increased syphilis <laughs> and, the and gonorrhea, results, yep. they might be seeing, oh, all these patients have had a Borna virus test yep. and they're all positive. So yep. just bear in mind, we, we may have actually picked this up a little earlier. But, but to answer the question, um, this is a situation we've thought a bit about, as you know, uh, in that typically what we've done in the past faced with something new, so the transplant transmitted arena virus or SARS or MERS, is you have it growing in culture and you make a, a what's called an immunofluorescent test. So you stick the infected cells on a glass slide and you can stain them um, with antibody and a fluorescent dye and look at the result down a microscope. And a skilled scientist can read that pretty accurately and, and get good results out of a first generation serology test. So you can do that pretty quickly and it gets you out of the starting blocks with an antibody test. And back in 2003, Vidral sent a little kit um, of such tests around the various labs in all the states to give everybody um, antibody testing capacity for SARS. Problem here is we haven't got the virus, and I'm assuming all our attempts have failed, even the organoids. So, failed. Yeah. So we have a couple of projects running at the moment. We haven't succeeded with them yet, so I'm sort of cat I'm assuming we'll have been facing this outbreak in a few years' time when we've succeeded with what we're currently doing. So, so what we want to do is look at the virus sequence be able to um, pick the important parts of the um, gene sequence that code for the bits the immune system sees, synthesise them, and create an antibody test based around them. So we've got a project going at the moment <coughs> in collaboration with Hans Netter, doing this with uh, an arbovirus called Ross River virus as a model, where we've got lots of good patients, Sera, to validate the test with. So synthesising the protein antigens, uh, the bits that the immune system sees, and hope to make a, an antibody test that way. And we've got another more recently started project, starting with the interesting ones with Ebola and Lassa viruses as it happens. Um, this is funded by a, a, a national group called The Prize that runs out of the Doherty. And this is to express the most of the structural bits of the virus to get it to assemble into what are called virus-like particles. So they're, they're the outer coat of the virus without the innards that make it infectious and replicating, and hoping to, that way, create something that's just like the immune system sees it without us having to be clever and figure out how the immune system sees it, and that way to create a really good um, serological test. Those are the sort of strategies we'd be trying to do so that we can get from viral sequence, which our current technology can get for us, to validated antibody test. And okay. Once you've got the technology working, you use your freezer bank of um, samples from the patients. You'd probably do it in collaboration around Australia because everybody's got cases. So the various labs of the Public <coughs> Health Lab Network could work together on that yep. um, and validate a test. Okay. 
Fabian, mm. how does this human behavioural change information alter the way you might investigate or look into the immunology of this infection? From maybe well, that, neuroscience. That, that's very interesting. I think, um, I mean, I think it's very peculiar. Um, <laughs> First of all, you know, I'd be careful with my research staff that probably had, you know, prenup arrangement as part of the occupation health and safety uh, measures. So it's probably one well, thing. Especially the married ones. That's right. Yeah. And then, um, but, but the one thing that is interesting, the thing that is very hard <coughs> to reproduce experimentally with an animal model is complex human uh, emotional behavior. Um, so there, there are a number of neurologists and neuroscientists who would be very interested in collaborating and maybe in partnership with uh, clinicians looking at MRI pictures, especially if we have an indication of the part of the brain where this particular uh, or the particular manifestation can be visible uh, through a scan or an MRI uh, picture. And that would lead to some uh, you know, that would raise a number of questions, but the, the part of that brain that actually controls and the neurological networks, so the neural networks that actually control this very complex human, um, you know, relationship, very complex <coughs> human social behavior that we can't really reproduce with uh, rodents or other animals. So that would open a lot of interesting perhaps ways of experimentally looking at that more carefully and use uh, advanced imaging, maybe very high magnet like an INCT to have a much more a high resolution on the part of the brain. Now, my understanding also, and again, looking at the literature, there could be inflammation uh, arising from that infection, especially locally in the, in the CNAs. So from an immune point of view also is trying to understand whether cells like glial cells and other cells that could be involved in that are perturbing, you know, the circuit that you might have in that particular part of the brain that have a major impact on um, disabling some um, natural uh, emotional and um, affection aspect of human beings interacting with each other, especially male, female and, and couples. So that's, uh, that's the interesting part, I think. Yeah, thank you. So Julian, serologic, serology testing is developed here at Vidral and the Doherty, and we find that 100% of those claiming to have changed their um, pair bonding ability are indeed antibody positive, with 0% of antibody positive de detected before the outbreak. Now we are one year in, and we are 20% of the population apparently seropositive. What's going to happen to society when pair bonding and the couple-based family unit are challenged? Well, again, I think it's important to base these decisions on science and not ideology or wishful thinking. Um, so, you, you know, it, single parents can bring up children very well, and what seems to make the biggest difference is um, either lack of education or conflict or violence. And 25% of women are the victim of sexual and domestic violence, so it might be better for women in, in this situation. We don't know. It, it might be better for children. It may be that by splitting up the labour 50-50, um, women have a better go in the workplace. So I don't think we can just speculate on whether this is socially going to be worse or better. I think we actually have to do some science yep. um, rather than just basing you know, our views on you know, Christian views of, of the way the nuclear family should be. Um, and then I think that we should, you know, allow people to make their own value judgments uh, on those. That's what we do with the divorce and family, reproductive freedom, and also the question of whether how families constituted. So I think it's a time to get going with some good science um, that's open around the lives of these people in this different way of being, you know, do they experience as much pleasure from sex? How do they care for their children? How do they relate to each other? You know, what are the implications for work? And it may be better. Yep. I mean, we, we have to think about OK, Catherine, epidemiologically, the link is proven. We've got 20% of the population infected. A second wave is coming. What, uh, what do we do in this instance? So I guess we, 
we have so, to look right. at ways to prevent yep. the disease. So um, if we know the mode of transmission and, and can demonstrate some effective um, way to stop that transmission, that's good. Um, and I guess a vaccine's always what we look for in infectious diseases is probably one of the most effective ways. Yeah, right. It's very hard to change behaviour. Um, yeah. Yep. Okay, Fabian. Mm -hmm. So vaccine development, how do we go about it? With what you know, no virus, no virus isolated, just sequence. Okay, well, we've heard a little bit from Mike earlier about a technology which is also referred to as uh, reverse vaccinology. It's tried to identify all the genes in the genome of that particular virus and try to express the protein uh, you know, coded by those genes and test the prote those protein for their ability to raise a strong and neutralizing immune response. So the, the idea would be to have a model. First of all, it would be great to have a model where we can actually infect cells. I mentioned the PC12 cells actually work for other Borna virus. I'm not sure it will work for this one. We could try. <coughs> and um, these cells um, respond to no, a nerve growth factor for differentiation into neuronal cells. But if they're infected with the virus, they won't respond. You know? So you, you, can, uh, you can try different things. If they're protected by an antibody from a patient immunized by the protein, the cells will respond because they'll be protected from the virus. And so we could test those antibodies in a way. Uh, so vaccinology can work or may not work. We know we have viruses where we try that and it's still not working. So the next thing we'll look for is how does the virus enter the cell? And a lot of viruses recognize receptors on the cells to enter the cells. So is there any way we can identify that receptor? And if we can find an inhibitor of that receptor that would prevent the virus from entering the cells, it would be an alternative treatment to a vaccine we can't create. Okay. So, Julian, vaccination is a, a reality. Who gets it first? Is it health professionals, children, young adults, or old people? Yeah, the old people, because they need their partners to look after them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. Um, I mean, in general, uh, it, you know, it's, this is a pretty easy ethical one because when it comes to adults, you should let them make their own choices. So we've got the LGBTQIA communities and I, I heard this thing at the Children's yesterday that, that some adolescents want to take puberty blockers indefinitely, never to go through puberty. So, you know, one of the kind of characteristics of our time is we get to choose our sexuality. And so when it comes to adults, I think just let them choose. The difficult case is children and um, do we vaccinate children and what sort of priority are they? So maybe they would be the top priority or the bottom priority. It depends on the impact of the different sexual orientations having on, on future wellbeing. So if it were the case that one of them led to much more unhappy lives, so for example, there is actually a human variant um, of, the, of the vol gene, the AVPR1A, and one of these polymorphisms um, males have many more reproductive partners. Um, their partners experience less satisfaction. Their relationships are unstable. Um, so if it were the case that this, this new um, polygamous way of being was associated with less empathy, less altruism, uh, more unstable relationships, greater unhappiness, then you might say we should prioritise vaccinating children. If, however, they were roughly equal, we might say this is in the zone of parental discretion. We can leave it to parents to decide whether they vaccinate their children and, and what the priority is. Um, but it will turn on, on actually the facts about its impact on that individual's own life and their behaviour towards others. Yep. Brendan, in federal government, Barnaby Joyce has just split from his partner. <laughs> mm -hmm. Family first senators have all been infected and now call themselves family last. <laughs> The newly single are saying they are not being listened to. They need tax breaks to afford to live alone. MPs are agitated. Constituents are ringing in demanding action. Will government throw money at this? And who or what will influence them the most? Uh, votes, I think. <laughs> I mean, I think the voles in parliament, um, <laughs> I'm not sure whether they're prairie voles or bowl voles, but it's, it's hard to know they ultimately respond to civil society and uh, uh, to some extent influenced by, by pressure groups. So I, th I think, you know, it's, 
It's one, it's one thing to say we have to decide whether people are happy or otherwise in this new, new environment. But the challenge is that our social structures are built on a set of relationships. And if we are going to live with this new world order, there's a huge change in many of our social structures, our political structures and our economic structures. So <coughs> I, I, I think inevitably if there's a weight of clamour for action uh, from, from an assertive civil society, politicians will, will make some adaptions. But it's, um, it, it would it'd be very interesting to see the evolution uh, of, of that political response. But ultimately, you know, they do what the community demands. Okay, thank you. So look, in the nature of time, I think we're running out of time, so we'll close here. As an audience, thank you for listening. As you can imagine, there are lots of other pathways and rabbit holes that we could have explored. We haven't even got to the international spread and the threat to population. But unfortunately, we don't have time for that today. But please ponder on how you might respond in such a scenario uh, and or indeed the implications for society beyond what we've discussed. I hope you'll agree that with so many Do Doherty Institute talents on the panel and the close relationship with our guests, the Doherty Institute would indeed be a crucial hub of activity if such an event were to unfold. Before I close, I would specifically like to thank Dr. Arjun Rajkawa over here and Professor Sharon Lewin for their help with the narrative. And can we please thank our distinguished panel uh, and thank you for coming. <laughs>